Today, I'm delighted to welcome back John Sweeney, who is a British investigative journalist and writer. He has worked for The Observer newspaper, BBC's Panorama, Newsnight, and many other outlets. He ceased working for the BBC in October 2019. He's now reporting on the war in Ukraine, giving his unique perspective to the conflict. He is, as we speak today, based in Kiev, so can give us some of the news uh, firsthand of what's going on there. He's also created a wildly popular war diary, which is available on X or uh, Twitter, for those who are still calling it that, like like me. Um, it is a very, very sort of short daily um, video, which I highly recommend people watch if you are still braving the X platform. Uh, he has also worked on a film, absolutely fantastic film, was called the Eastern Front. I don't know if that's the current name of the film, but again, if you can get access to stream that and see it, I highly recommend it. It's one of the most powerful works to come out of the war so far, documenting Russia's crimes. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any fantastic guests on the channel and definitely check out the Ukrainian charities that appear in the description of the video. It is incredibly important to help Ukrainians remain resilient at this time. John, welcome back. Well, hi, Jonathan. How are you? I'm, uh, yes, not bad. Not bad. I'm getting used to uh, doing a lot more time on this kind of stuff. I think it's the right kind of time to uh, to, to flip and, uh, and uh, you know, make this the primary focus of my effort. But there is the challenge is there's so much to talk about. And I think today there's a million things I like to fire at you. Uh, we'll probably only get through a fraction of those. One that really struck me, though, was the detonation of of a huge thermobaric munition. This is apparently in Russia's arsenal, the largest weapon uh, that is sub-nuclear, and it looks like they have exploded it in the center of Volchansk. Um, I don't see much coverage of this in the mainstream media, but to me, this seems like an extraordinary gesture, an extraordinary outburst of violence. What should be the Western reaction to such a thing? Well, we should um, we should properly arm Ukraine, and um, and at the moment uh, Ukraine is fighting Russia with uh, one hand tied behind its back. Principally, um, there is a serious problem inside the Biden White House. Effectively, in simple, plain language, Putin is a bully, and Biden is afraid of him. And that is not good for the whole Western world, not good for the United States of America, and not at all good for Ukraine. But this big bomb, let me try and explain to um, the viewers and listeners what it is, because I've come across these things in Chechnya uh, in 2000, I went undercover uh, to Chechnya in February 2000, before uh, Vladimir Putin had won his election. Vladimir Putin, do fuck off. I always like to say that. <laughs> Can I say that? I just did. Um, uh, by the way, I'm wearing my lucky orange hat, but it's hot outside, so I'm actually going to take it off, and you can now see uh, what, what lies underneath. <laughs> <laughs> the ravages of time become uh, plain to everyone hey, to see it. <laughs> Jonathan, busy roads run smooth. Um, so, um, so what happened was we got to this village. I think it was on the um, Kachi Yurta on the edge of it, and it had been hit by a fuel air bomb, a vacuum bomb, a thermo um, barrack bomb. What this means, as I understand it, and I'm not, um, I'm not a train spotter, nor am I a tank spotter, and sometimes I get this wrong, but um, there was an old Chechen guy, the father of the, uh, the family, and he was on crutches, and um, his, there was some rubble, but actually quite a few buildings were intact, but the windows had gone. And he said that he'd lost 18 members of his family with one of these fuel air bombs. Let's call it that. And essentially, to understand what happens, there's a two-stage release. There's a big bomb comes down, and around about 200 feet above ground level, it explodes um, with a small detonation, but releases an enormous cloud of petroleum jelly, or petroleum um, goo, which then there is a secondary explosion that ignites and it sucks all the oxygen for a long way around into itself. And now this kills 18 members of his family. But actually, 
kept buildings more or less intact. Windows were shattered, but the, the bricks and masonry were there. So it's a slightly weird effect. What it does to human beings, Jonathan, is it sucks. There is the blast. The, the blast is huge, like it's a blast bomb. So if you're um, caught in the middle of it, um, you're blasted to bits and your, you know, your head, your, the whole thing gone. If you're on the edge of it, the, there is this terrible whoosh of air um, feeding the explosion, sucking the air in, sucking oxygen in, and people's lungs are sucked inside out. Um, or the gas flame, the gas ball, burns people's lungs. So it's a truly horrible method of war. It's been banned against civilians. And if they hit both chunks, and I've been there, um, 22, in the autumn of 22, I, it, there will be, as there always is in these war zones, old people, often old ladies, who buried their husband in the local cemetery, and I've heard it myself, and more than once, more than once, I'm not leaving because my fella is in that cemetery down there and I'm not leaving him. So it's very likely that the Russians committed a war crime here. By the way, so this weapon is okay against, against soldiers, but it is, in my mind, barbaric. And, and you, we've got to meet Russian fascism with sufficient force to expel it from Ukraine. And the problem is that whatever the rhetoric that's coming from the West, the delivery is really, really quite different. The delivery is poor. And why is the delivery poor? Essentially, because the Biden White House, and, and the problem is there is no other support of Ukraine with anything like the amount of military power that the United States has got, that they're afraid of Ukrainian victory leading to Putin's humiliation, Putin's end, end in power, which almost certainly means end, and then that is followed by Russian chaos. And the particular problem for uh, Biden, well, there are two problems here. First of all, he is a child of the Cold War. He grew up with a threat of nuclear annihilation rested over all of us. He's very, very worried about that. Too worried, in fact. And I'll go into the reasons why, but I'm setting out the problem first. The second thing is that Iraq scarred the United States deeply. It was a terrible geostrategic mistake. And what happened was by getting rid of Saddam, they un uh, unlocked a Pandora's box of horrors. Principally, the majority population in Iraq is Shia, um, one of the two um, halves, if you like, of, um, of Islam. And the Shia, um, although they're Arabs, they're, their brothers in religion, or brothers and sisters in religion, are in Iran. And so effectively, you've had something like an Iranian takeover of Iraq. Not quite, but something like that. And you had um, a, you know, a government and a country that, has a, that hates the United States next door helping um, Iraqis subvert the American occupation. And this caused an enormous amount of grief for America. And they squandered trillions of dollars um, on, on not achieving stability in Iraq. And the stability that's there is more, it is now more of a colony of Tehran than it is of Washington, D.C. So they are terrified, Biden in particular, of Russia turning into Iraq 2.0. They never say this. It's never articulated, but there is a massive problem with the policy. Now, look what Israel is doing right now. 
And by the way, I believe in a two-state solution. I believe um, that Netanyahu is one of the driving forces of Putin, uh, Netanyahu's behavior is that it, the more he he bombs the Palestinians and now Hezbollah and now the uh, Iranians, the more his ratings will rise, the less chance he has of going to jail. Um, I also understand that Israel needs to and has to defend it itself in an appropriate way. But I'm also conscious, having been an old war reporter, that there are there are armies um, and countries that defend themselves in an appropriate way, and then there are some countries who overdo it. And I would point the finger at, at Israel and that now right now. But I have to say that Israel has sent a message, don't fuck with us, and people get it. And the problem is Ukraine doesn't have Israel's firepower. And also there is a big difference between Hezbollah, for example, and Russia. So the person who needs the will to fight Russia or to help Ukraine fight Russia is the president of the United States. At the moment, that's Joe Biden. And he's afraid of Putin. So there's this awful timidity. And, and, and the problem is it's kind of a situation where you're being bullied at school and, and you see a teacher, a big, strong teacher walking by, help me. And the big teacher ignores you and carries on, and the bully carries on hitting you. That's what's happening in Bovchanks. And there's still, it seems, and uh, you know, I, I observed this when the uh, Russian dissidents were released, and the extraordinary adulation in Washington. I mean, I called it a sort of uh, some kind of weird Cold War fantasy, um, fantasy land, in fact. But there seems to be a projection of Western frameworks and Western ways of thinking onto Russia. At one time, you know, they are rational, uh, but we seek to rationalise them in the way that, that, that we would act in, in those circumstances. And other times we look at them as wildly irrational. They're going to collapse. Goodness knows what's going to happen. It seems to me that Russia is logical within its own framework, but it's a very different framework from uh, from our own. And it's one which policymakers in Washington, Berlin, still do not understand. This thermobaric munition, I mean, many, if it gets reported at all, it will be looked at as some kind of military, strategic, tactical thing. When, when it's none of those, it's not going to advance um, Russia's sort of strategic uh, battlefield situation. But it is a weapon of terror, and it's a weapon of malice, and it's a way of mocking the weakness of the West of Biden. I think there's, a, there's an element there, a vindictive element there of mockery uh, when Russia unleashes some of these terror attacks, including the uh, attack on the cancer ward, uh, the cancer hospital, uh, children's hospital in, in uh, Kiev. Did they do it because it's going to win the war? Did they do it because Ukraine's going to suddenly sort of give in and surrender? No, I think they do it to mock as well Western foreign policy, and that is one of the aspects of it. Yes, you've got to. I had a conversation about this at breakfast um, yesterday. You've got to understand that there are the Soviet Union was for most of its time an evil dictatorship, and towards the end, as it became as the machinery or the human, the human machinery, if you like that metaphor, um, became more and more gerontocratic got older and more feeble it became less less bad under stalin it was a dictatorship very little different from nazi germany apart from the anti-semitism and the holocaust but before the holocaust happened you would be hard put to say which is worse you might well say that stalinism was worse than nazism I had that argument with my my father, who uh, would, wouldn't 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 align with it on that. But you've got a uh, um, um, yeah. Until the Holocaust, the Holocaust makes puts Nazi Germany in a darker place, far darker, the worst um, government in uh, in history in modern times or in modern history, and the darkest. But this, the shadow, the Soviet shadow casts. Kind of long gloom over 
Russia and Ukraine, and Ukraine too, and I can talk about some of those, uh, the failings of Ukraine to deal, uh, to open up the shutters, to get the light in. It's a serious problem. But, but in Russia, it, <laughs> the Soviet shadows are very, very long indeed and very, very dark. And Putin, I mean, in Moscow, there is a... Um, there is a metro station with a bit of a homage to Stalin. You know, it's not a big thing, but it's there. And there's nothing like that to Hitler in any single German metro station in Berlin. Not at all. Of course there isn't. But why is there in Moscow? Because of double standards. Because after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was never a kind of de-Stalinization program like there was in West Germany. Now, listen, it wasn't perfect by any means, but it was an attempt to denazify, and that attempt was never made by central government, ever. Although there was a loosening up that wasn't a, a proper attack. So you've got these Soviet shadows, and remember, you know, under the Tsars, until, until they lost the Crimean War, until the Russians lost the Crimean War, um, the vast majority of the population were not free, they were serfs. Um, um, Slav is, I think the etymology is correct, is the base word for slave. So you've got a kind of, in Russia, you've got a slave state. And, and the problem, um, and this is a White House problem, but it's also true in Berlin and Paris and London, to a lesser degree perhaps, but you have a problem of understanding the nature of, 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 of those long Soviet shadows in Moscow. And because of this, and they project um, Western, um, Western tropes, Western structures, Western thinking onto this barbarous, still more or less Stalinist mindset. My friend Andrei Soldatov, who, by the way, whose father is seriously ill, he's dying, and he's been locked up in prison in Moscow. Andrei uh, and his partner Irina, who are great friends of mine, live in exile in London, and what's happening is the, the Russian state is torturing his elderly father, who, by the way, was the main Russian internet pioneer. He was the guy who helped build the Russian internet. And what they're doing, they're torturing this old man. But he once said to me, for the panorama I made in 2018, taking on Putin, he said, we're all still afraid of Stalin's secret police. And the problem that Biden and the people around him have got, Jake Sullivan, his hopeless and hapless national security advisor, so they don't get that. They're not talking and they're thinking of, of how Russians think. They don't understand that this long Soviet shadow still rests on their hearts. And they don't understand that, that, that ordinary Russians are more or less hostages, captives, who are not free to speak their own mind. Who I once asked a, a Chechen woman uh, who was eight when the, her whole family were blown to bits by a Russian uh, bomb. And... Uh, and I caught up with her years later, um, and I said, <clears throat> for my book, Killer in the Kremlin, I said, are you afraid to speak? She said, no, we're afraid to breathe. And Biden doesn't get that. It's extraordinary, isn't it? And the other great survivor is the KGB. It may have rebranded itself several, several times, but in my estimation, it is no less vile than the SS. And um, if you listen to analysts like uh, Yuri Felshtinsky, essentially the multiple organs of political power that exist in the Soviet Union, where the KGB was one part of, uh, of uh, a balance of power, that's gone away. I mean, the, the KGB slash sort of Putin's guys, that, that's the only game in town now. Um, and that, again, is a survival of a very, very dark period, undiminished. Other studies have shown that the nomenclatura 
the uh, leading figures, whether it be in politics, culture, or the Sylvia Key, more of them have remained in place and transitioned their status and privilege to their offspring than in any other uh, country that left the orbit of the Soviet Union. I think the figure was something like 60%, which is double the, the, the next nearest country in terms of the survivability of the old guard. All your engagement with the videos on this channel is massively appreciated, as well as encouraging comments and the financial support you provide. Some of you will have donated to Ukrainian charities, including the ones listed in the descriptions of these videos. I know many of you ask how you could be doing more to help Ukraine, and that includes me. Well, here is news of a project that I think could make a huge difference. It's been initiated by Silicon Curtain, and I hope will support Ukrainians on the ground and in the diaspora and create real impact to help ensure a Ukrainian victory. It's a documentary film to be made in Ukraine later this year and shown internationally, hopefully at film festivals and on Silicon Curtain as well. We aim in the film to follow the 75th aid convoy to Ukraine by a remarkable team based in Poland, delivering vital medical, humanitarian, and military aid that helps Ukrainians remain resilient. No doubt the efforts of this team has saved innumerable lives of Ukrainian servicemen and women fighting on the front line of freedom. We have a unique opportunity to share authentic stories on the world stage through this film via film festivals, social media, and streaming to Silicon Curtain. The film will provide a counterweight to Russian propaganda films such as Russians at War. It will show spontaneous stories gathered on the journey as we travel the length of the front line. Filming footage and interviews along the journey, we will have a unique opportunity to convey the shared humanity and common cause of Ukrainians living with war. The film will focus on stories of hope and resilience with the war as a backdrop and aims to create a compelling narrative and tone that is entirely authentic. Well, here's the important bit. We're aiming to raise £12,000 to record the dog sled tournament and create a stunning trailer for the project. Overall, the project will cost up to $100,000 for end-to-end -end production and distribution. For the price of a DVD rental or a streamed movie, you could help create a film that raises awareness of Ukraine's struggle and generates funds for further aid convoys. Supporters of the film will get early access to see it and free access to the film for all time. This is a bold and ambitious project, but it will be led by an experienced documentary team with a professional cinematographer. It is time, I think, to join together to achieve something powerful and unique for Ukraine. After reviewing many project ideas, we feel that this is the best way that we can have an impact. Tentatively titled To the Edge of Freedom, here is a short description of the film. A world champion dog sled racer navigates dangerous obstacles through the apocalypse-like battle zones of Ukraine's front line, delivering life-saving aid to ordinary heroes engaged in extraordinary acts of valor. Igor Trox, the team leader, is a remarkable personality and relentless supporter of Ukraine throughout the full-scale war. The film starts in Finland at the World Championship Dog Sled Tournament with Igor. Fresh from his 11th World Championship in dog sled racing, Igor Trantz leads his foundation's 75th humanitarian mission to the front lines of war-torn Ukraine. For this mission, Igor's team is joined by a few friends from the US and UK who will not only provide hands-on support, but share what they learn on the ground with new sources in the West. Our cameras follow Igor from Finland to Gdansk to Lviv to Mykolaiv, Kherson to Dnipro, Pakrovsk, Kharkiv and other frontline cities facing the brunt of Russian aggression. Along the way, they will meet colourful and determined individuals fighting for their families' right to survive. Igor and his team navigate life and death situations to bring much-needed supplies, visiting bunkers, hospitals, and units whose success may not merely determine the fate of this ancient culture, but of the West itself. The film will follow Igor's latest aid convoy to the front line 
and back again. I hope this description will inspire you to become part of the film project and make a difference to the war's outcome, a war that Ukraine must win clearly and decisively. Please do find the donation link in the description of the video and do reach out to me if you have any questions at all about the project and its intended impact. Uh, what you're dealing with is a nation which has been captured by its intelligence agency. So it's like MI6 taking over the whole of Britain. And by the way, for any lunatics out there, let's, I just want to point out a couple of simple things. Yeah, I've got some friends who used to be in MI6, people like Christopher Steele, Arthur Snell. But they're really good people, and they're funny. Um, they're, I'm, their politics are not conservative. I'll put it just like that. Um, but they don't run the country, and they didn't run the country when they were in that organisation, or nothing like it. For example, it's way too small. The KGB slash FSB, as it's now called, back in Stalin's day, it was called the GPU, the GPU, or the uh, NKVD, or a number of names. But this is an intelligence agency which essentially has captured an entire a regime and then has captured the country. And what and. There is no, you know, the ideology of communism, that's long dead. And what you've got is a, a vicious, selfish criminality. Um, but this isn't straight gangsterism. It is gangsterism with what they like to say is with epaulets on, or it's gangsterism where the big gangsters wear uniforms, and the most common uniform is a general in the KGB. And th that is, by the way, there's an air raid um, sermon just going off right now. I never um, hit a uh, shelter out of... Uh, there is a bottle of rather nice Italian red in front of me. Things get, go bad. Uh, <laughs> I, I, so I'll just carry on. But it gives you a flavour of what's life here. So, so there is a failure of um, Biden doesn't quite get what he's dealing with and Schultz doesn't quite get what he's dealing with and the problem is that while Putin is in power he is an incredibly supple guy a common question I get asked is if Putin falls will the, his successor be worse and I said well no because Putin is really cunning and really really smart can you hear the air raid siren by the way it's coming through very very faintly yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's a shivery. It's a sound that makes me shiver. It goes it goes up and down like a wave. Um, but um, uh, by the way, I'm just looking out the window, and people there is the usual portray of extraordinary beautiful women who seem to be walking a little bit quicker than normal. That's all that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Keith stands, um, but. The Americans don't get it, or they're afraid of they're afraid of nuclear war, and they're afraid of um, they're afraid of Russian collapse leading to Russian chaos, leading to what God knows what. The problem is, you've got to deal. You've got to deal with the bully in front of you, and you can't say, "Hey, hey, hey! If if I actually stand up to this bully, then another bigger bully will come along." No, you can't do that. That's not how you how you survive primary school. In my experience, you just got to stand up to the bully and say, you know, bugger off. And it, it, it may hurt you in the beginning, but it's the way to do it, to show you've got fight. Now, Zelensky came to Washington and he was humiliated by Donald Trump. We all saw that. But behind the scenes, he was humiliated by Biden too. And Biden's humiliation was crueler because superficially on the surface it's all lovey-dovey but Zelensky was asking can I use long-range rocket artillery which you've given me the Atacams can the British uh, who've given us storm shadows can there's, there are American components and con contractually as I understand it the Americans the British can't say to the Ukrainians use our storm shadows 
because there are too many American bits and bobs in the rockets. Can we please use them specifically against targets, rocket factory or rocket um, um, uh, blast uh, places where they're launching, launching pads, so we're firing back at the Russian rockets before they kill our people? And the answer was no. And the answer is no, because Biden's afraid of nuclear war. Look at what the Chinese said. And they got into this. I was worried about nuclear war in September 22, and I was watching the Chinese. And the first Chinese official who said it very plainly was the deputy head of mission at the UN in China, at the, um, the Chinese uh, delegation to the UN in New York. And he said there should be no nuclear adventurism. Ukrainians don't have nukes. No nuclear adventurism is directed straight at Moscow. Then the Chinese foreign minister said it, same language. Then there was a Tyrant Saras uh, conference in Samarkand, and Xi said it himself. So the Chinese do not want the Russians to use the nuke at all, because that will um, cause the world economy to hit a massive depression, and China is worried about its economy. So Biden's fears are utterly misplaced. At the same time, he's got to understand that Trump is being supported by Putin in ways that we don't properly have got all the detail on, but that was certainly the finding of the, the intelligence community in America after the 2016 election, and it feels like exactly the same thing is happening right now. So if we, if, if we don't stand up to the, to the Russians, then our own societies and our own politics, our own democracies will be hollowed out by Russian alliances, the alliance of Russian dark money with the far right or the far left across the Western world. And that's happening. Tommy Robinson's been to Russia. Marie Le Pen borrowed from Russian banks. The AFD, thick with the Russians. Matteo Salvini, his consigliere, went to Moscow, had a conversation in the Metropolitan Hotel. That particular avenue of dark money um, was never acted upon. But was that the only one, or it's the only one we know about? I don't think so. And then there's so Austria the problem... as well. Austria, Hungary, yes, Serbia. And... There's a whole bunch of state yes, but... capture almost. Yes, no, exactly. So the problem is that the that, that the fear of uh, fear of Russian collapse undermines a far greater worry, fear of Western collapse, because it seems we don't have the will, the balls to defend ourselves properly. By the way, I'm always an optimist. Kamala is the vice president of the United States, but she used to work in McDonald's. What's that tell you? It tells you she's a fighter. And you saw her when she debated with Trump. You know, she went and shook his hands. She looked at him in the eye. He, he was scared of her. He didn't want to do that. Because she's beneath him. Well, I don't think so. Uh, um, but she's a fighter. And the moment she gets, I hope she wins. I hope and pray she wins. But the moment she gets in, what she's going to do is she's going to have to copy Elizabeth I at Tilbury Docks when she said, you know, I have a heart, um, I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart of an English king. And Kamala's going to have to do something like that. And the first thing, I think the easiest way of her showing that she's different to Biden is sending, say, 20,000 um, Bradley armoured personnel vehicles, which are gathering rust in the Arizona desert. You send those to the Ukraine. It's a simple non-nuclear thing, but it will change the war very, very quickly. The ability of the Ukrainian army to look after its people better. You have all of that heavy metal going and lots and lots of it. And then Putin looks at the stream of heavy metal and then says, OK, OK, we'll do a deal. The Ukrainians can't sit down and do a deal with Putin because the Russians have raped too many people, castrated too many 
poor Ukrainian prisoners of war. They've tortured so many and they've stolen all these children. But there can be a kind of North Korea, South Korea kind of stop. And, and things are bleak here in Ukraine. That's true. People are depressed. They're not going to give up and they're not going to collapse. But it's, it's certainly true to say that the expectations are way nothing like they were. In the, in the autumn of 22, the Ukrainians had taken back Kiev and Kharkiv and Kherson, and they were on the move, and there was going to be this great counteroffensive in the spring, and that failed badly. And then since then, Ukrainians have gone backwards. One exception is in Kursk, and what the Russians have done is poison the river there, so there's every creature in that river is now dead. And 350 kilometers, if people need to envisage what they've done there, it's a huge stretch of, of uh, what was pristine uh, nature and water. Yeah, and it feeds into the Dnipro, so that, that poison is going to infect the whole of Ukraine. And they're hammering uh, Sumi, a city I was in uh, in August, um, so you're left with a, I mean, I think I'm an optimist if Kamala gets in. You can wipe this entire conversation if Trump gets in. Because then everything that's, that's optimistic becomes pessimistic very quickly. I don't think that Ukraine will collapse completely. I think the Europeans and the British will do their very best to help Ukraine. But if the American military aid is switched off, there will be a fresh, massive refugee crisis. There will be an awful lot of soul searching. Um, well, and Trump, I think, is Putin's creature, and he won't. He will see Ukraine suffer if he gets in. The polls at the moment are good. Every every night, I give thanks and praise to Nude America. You're familiar with uh, Nude America? No. Jonathan, it's, it's the kind of thing you'd watch all the time, I'm sure. Uh, it's a black... <laughs> it's a, I think it may even be black Nude America. There's the Republican Trump-appointed candidate for the governorship of North Carolina. There's a guy called Mark Robinson, and he went on about a decade ago uh, as, as his, under his own name, he said, I'm a black Nazi on this porn website. He commented on the porn website. He also said he liked transgender porn. Now, hey, you know, transgender, trans, good luck to you, but I don't want to watch your porn. <laughs> and like, no, like, and yeah. Nazis famously uh, into that stuff, <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah, anyway, but he's a black guy, and he's saying, I'm a black Nazi. Anyway, so his chances... Um, of winning, of becoming the governor of North Carolina, have tanked, but he's dragging down the Trump vote in North Carolina, and now it's in play in a way it was very much on the Republican side before. So that's why I support Black Nude um, America. <laughs> I'll have to, I have to check that out. That does sound like my kind oh, of. Oh, by the way, it may even be called Nude Africa. I haven't. I'm honestly. I, I'm. I've, um, anyway, check out the story. Um, I, that may well get this video through. demonetized, by the way. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, good people out there, we've got to. This is how we earn a living. You've you've got to you've got to help us. Uh, click clickbait, anyway. definitely clickbait. Well, there's one topic I wanted to cover off because it brings it all together. You've got this extraordinary, and this isn't um, an endorsement of Israeli policy in Gaza or anything, but. Today, the story has come out that they have hit a Russian airbase in Syria, taken out a ton of rockets, goodness knows what else. That is not just the power of deterrence. It's showing that when deterrence isn't enough, you 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 go and you strike back, you slap back without fear um, and against Russia. It follows, I don't know if you saw a couple of days ago, um, our friend Solovyov was basically saying, well, we're at war with Israel now. And he was giving it the usual blah, blah, blah. Two days later... Israel shows him what what the the power of his misplaced rhetoric actually means. It's a stark contrast, obviously, to Berlin and Washington. But I don't know if you're also hearing these kind of murmurings. It seems that even in Europe, um, where there's more of an appetite for attacks and a shadow to be used, there are rumblings in the corridors of power saying that 
actually freezing the lines of contact may be the only option, ceding territory, and then we'll let Ukraine into NATO and build it up, etc. This is some kind of plan B in place. That seems to me an extremely dangerous speculation, uh, let alone something that policymakers are um, taking seriously. Yeah, so um, I think there is a real plan B. Um, and, and, and really, the problem is they've never, they've never delivered on plan A, which is to give the Ukrainians the stuff they need in a timely fashion. Uh, so the Ukrainian soldiers, I know, were saying things like, hey, um, we, um, <clears throat> we, by the way, the website was called Nude Africa, I remember now. Uh, the uh, Ukrainians were never given enough stuff. Plan B is let the Russians sit on what they've got. Now, the problem is that if, if Biden persists, uh, Biden's leaving in January, come what may, if Trump comes in, it's a disaster for Ukraine. If Kamala comes in, I think because she's a woman, she'll be under pressure to show her steel. And therefore, I'm a bit of an optimist that actually America will, will change its policy and deliver it. The, 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 the problem is, of course, that the Chinese are watching. And at the moment, there is only one Western leader or leader in the West who is showing a lack of fear when trouncing his enemies, and that's Benjamin Netanyahu. And actually, I think he's overdoing it. And in the long term, he's making the West less secure because I think it's very, very likely and People like the former head of MI5, Lisa, what's her name, um, Manningham Buller, something like this, is saying, you know, there are going to be terror attacks. I think that's a real possibility. But nevertheless, you've got a Netanyahu is saying to his enemies, don't you dare, dare hit Israel. We have an ally in Ukraine, ally, uh, an ally that has been the victim of a pitiless and barbarous war, and we're still buying Russian oil and gas. We're still letting Russian money trade on the international money markets. We're still allowing Russian oligarchs to sue each other in the London courts. Our sanctions are more or less ineffective. We are not doing enough, and we need to do far, far more. And by the way, the reason I'm, I'm urging this is because I don't want, you know, my son or my daughter to have to join the British Army to go to war against Russia. I don't want that to happen. But it might happen if we keep on being weak. It's far better to, be, to use effective deterrence now I'm not saying we should go and fight in Ukraine, the British army. I'm saying we need to give the Ukrainians more stuff. And, and, and the most, uh, and essentially our defensive wall is as strong as weak as the weakest of us. And the weakest of us all is, is the most strong, Joe Biden. So for the moment, Ukraine suffers and waits and waits and waits. And it is depressing um, when your your entire future is governed by how Pennsylvania will swing. And or, there are so many or, ways out of this. There are so many ways handing over the 300 billion in assets, pumping money into the highly capable uh, Ukrainian defense industry, which Denmark announced this week. There are so many ways, I think, in which the West could support, not explicitly even for a full Ukrainian victory, but, but far more robustly than is currently the case. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think the, you know, the problem with Britain is because we were hit by COVID and then, we're, and then we did Brexit. And the, the two things have given a, a massive hit to the British economy. And we don't have the money, uh, or we have a Labour Chancellor who is frightened of spending the money because of the reaction of the bond markets and doesn't seem to be able to plan her way out of this mess. So um, that's scary too. Um, 
but we should we need to do this because if we don't things will be far worse if Trump gets in we'll see this refugee crisis be awful and and also we'll we'll see a rise not just in Russian adventurism but Chinese adventurism as well so the very thing that Trump always says he's most afraid of is the rise of China is facilitated by helping Russia because Russia and China are their allies. You know, I'm in this city, you know, just the other day, Shahid drones um, were fired at this place. They were knocked out of the sky by the Ukrainians. Well done, terrific. But they're made in Iran. Some of the, the rockets and some of the ammunition that comes here, come, uh, fired by the Russians and the Ukrainians, comes from North Korea. So you do have an axis of evil. It is true. They do talk to each other. And it turns out that China and Iran and North Korea have been far better allies to the Kremlin than the United States and Germany and France and Britain has been to Ukraine. I, I went to an event, that. yeah. I mean, yesterday I had yeah. an event with Michael Sheridan where his research and those of his uh, his uh, you know collaborators there who who have a, a you know can read Chinese uh, sources they now estimate that up to eighty percent of the components in battlefield drones that Russia is using are coming from China. The U.S. is aware of it, but is stifling that information or is leaking it out in dribs and drabs because to admit it would require some fairly robust responses and action. Yeah, and they, they, um, and, and, and the problem with it, you know, this is kind of a game. And who are the losers in this game? Well, the Ukrainians. I mean, I, in, the, in the summer, I went to um, um, a town in the center of Ukraine, which is it's a city, which is the home of Ukrainian special forces. And a year ago, there was a line of squares, and on each face of the square, there was a face of a, of a dead. Ukrainian soldier uh, and now those squares they have gone across the road and there's a whole new line but they're not squares they're octagons Ukraine is bleeding to death both in terms of people soldiers money everything you know because this war grinds on Putin doesn't care about the dead so um, it's desperate and what's happening as the bully monsters the victim the big people with the big power in the West are afraid to turn up to the bully and say, stop this, or you're in trouble. And it's a colossal fight. Jonathan, it feels like we're, we're back in 1938, people like you and me saying, we've got to stand up to Hitler. But the people in power saying, no, 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 you can check it back here, it doesn't really matter. Yes, it does. They're making a terrible mistake. And deluding themselves that they can reason, rationalise with Hitler, give him another piece of land and he'll be satisfied, he'll go away. This seems to be the same problem with Putin. I know you have to, to jump off. It seems that Western strategy should have been geared to convincing Putin he cannot win this war. Does Putin still believe that he's winning and that he can win and we haven't disabused him of that idea? Oh, I think he knows he's winning. I mean, he's you know his his army is it's adapted. Forty percent of the Russian state economy is now um, focused entirely on killing Ukrainians. Um, and you, this is a criticism of Zelensky, a man I admire greatly, but he's but he like all human beings, he has made mistakes and he's got flaws. And essentially, there was an argument between him and General Zelensky. The solution he said, we need a war economy and we need a war society. We need to really change the draft. And Zelensky, it, it, this is still a peace economy and a peace, it's a peace economy with a very big defense budget, but it's still a peace economy. It hasn't, Ukraine hasn't caught up with Russia. Um, and that's also true in terms of the draft. There are too many rich young men in Kiev and Odessa who are not in the army in a way that they were in the army during the Second World War in Britain. Um, and that's not right, and it's not fair, 
And I think Solution was right about that. But it also goes, we're in the West. So, for example, the Challenger 2 tank, it's a good tank. The Russians call it, uh, the Ukrainians call it the sniper tank. They like it. But they, uh, but we gave them 14. I mean, like, come on, that's not going to make any difference. And Jonathan, what's happened to the factory that made those Challenger 2 tanks? It's now a housing estate. We, we are dealing with a psychopath in Vladimir Putin who has seized a country, a country full of people who still live in the long Soviet shadow, who are terrified of Stalin's secret police to this day. And this is a formidable enemy and 40% of their state economy is dedicated to this war and, and, and we're giving two or three percent it's not enough we've got to fix this problem and at the moment we're failing and in that regard putin is winning and ukraine and the west are losing and all we can do is keep shouting that keep trying to influence people and persuade them that they misunderstand russia and are not approaching it in the correct way john we all appreciate everything you're doing, the risks you take uh, daily uh, by reporting from Ukraine and your trips uh, close to the front line. Thanks so much for coming back on the channel and uh, explaining all this in such a clear and forceful way. Pleasure, Jonathan. Um, beers on me next time we meet. <laughs>